Appreciate you streaming in here on Bird Street 65. McMullen McDonald and Jeff McClain joins us. I haven't had Jeff on in a while, and he looks like a guy who, much like McMullen and McDonald, just was out walking a dog. Do we have that right? Is that why you're wearing the hat, McClain? <laughs> I wear the hat in, inside. It's a little chilly in here during the day. Cold out, out, man. The kids yeah. aren't here, so we turn down the temperature. Oh, yeah. Makes Smart sense. Man. Yeah. Save a few bucks here and there. All right, Jeff. Um, there's so much to unpack. Um, I guess we'll start. You reported, confirmed uh, Derek Gunn's report here that Brian Johnson will be out as offensive coordinator. Also said uh, Jim Bob Cooter was one of the names floated early. Uh, it won't be among the top candidates. Um, your perspective of, of these coordinator changes as a whole, to me, feels like scapegoating. Um, and I want to get your thought process on it and Jeffrey and how we have a history of doing this. Uh, and we don't have to go back very far with Doug Peterson, but I don't know. It seems like delaying the inevitable. If you're going to start saying Nick Sirianni, you can come back, but in place sort of standards and you have to do this, do that. Your, your thoughts. Well, I mean, I, th I think it's pretty evident that something needed to change on the offensive side of the ball. And if you're looking at the three main pieces on that side of the ball and you've decided that one, the guy who uh, came up with the scheme and is in charge of the team is staying, then there's only two. And then you have a quarterback that has a major contract devoted to him. So he isn't going anywhere. So that leaves basically one guy. Um, and look, I, you know, the, from what I understand, if you're looking at it and I don't think, all everything will ever always be unpacked. But as we learn here over the next few years, I'm sure we'll find out exactly what happened to, that led to the offense to, to go from what it was in 2022 to what it, what it became in 2023. But, you know, I mean, yeah, the play calling was a factor. Um, and, and I think some of it had to do with the relationship between, Brian and Jalen Hurts. I mean, he's probably not in Philadelphia. He probably doesn't get promoted to offensive coordinator unless it's Jalen Hurts. We, they have had an uh, existing relationship since he was four years old. Uh, Brian Johnson played for played for Jalen's father. Uh, they know each other well. But Brian also brought a lot of the you know zone read, RPR, RPO game to the Eagles' offense that accentuated Jalen's abilities. And, you know, those were successful for two years, but for some reason that element was not. So you can really point to um, Brian in, in that regard and, and when you're looking for reasons why the offense wasn't, wasn't functioning as well in 2023. But all, all that being said, yeah, I mean, I, you know, scapegoat is a word I guess you could use um, because, again, it is Nick's offense. It's his scheme. It was Nick's job ultimately to come up and be a step ahead of these defensive coordinators that spent all off season looking at your offense and you have to be a step ahead. And I spoke to Nick right before the season of phone call conversation he had on his ride home. It was really more about how Nick was kind of hammered down on, on his players and becoming a little more uh, disciplined and how he approached them. But there was a quote in there that I, that I went back and listened to for my podcast that kind of like I, I, I wasn't thinking about it when I was listening to it, but now it, it just screams that he didn't do take the necessary steps. And he was talking about hammering down more on what the Eagles do well, as opposed to changing much. That really spoke to the problems that we saw on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah. I was going to bring that up before you jump in, Jody, uh, uncovering the birds, uh, Jeff's podcast, tremendous, get it where you get your uh, favorite podcast. Uh, because I listen into that particular interview you're talking about, that phone interview, and there was a little, I don't know if you want to call it arrogance, but there was a little bit of honing down. Look, we're so good at what we do. You just improve that a little bit other than, you know, teams are going to adjust and we're going to have to adjust back. It, it, um, is that sort of what you looked at it in hindsight and said, ooh, I better listen to this again? Yeah. And, you know, it kind of, um, yeah, I've heard people use the word arrogant. Um, I don't think it's like Chip Kelly arrogance, but 
it was a, a belief in a scheme that worked very well in 2022. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they really Maybe you should believe play. in it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, I kind of get that part. Um, but it just, it's a static offense and there aren't a lot of moving pieces. And I think if you just try and hammer down on that, it just doesn't look much different for defenses. So they can pick up on tendencies a lot easier. And I think that just started being a problem. Uh, but I, I don't want to leave Jalen Hurts out of the equation here, too, because, again, a lot of a lot of what, you know, of course, the big, you know, narrative on Brian Johnson is, oh, he's going to call another screen and it's going to fail. Well, <laughs> as you know, guys, the, a lot of this offense is just based strictly. It's a very simple offense in some ways uh, based upon box counts. And if you're going to see a blitz, some of the answers were in screens. And a lot of that was on Jalen to make those decisions at the line. And a lot of times he just would throw it out. Uh, to those screens. Now, maybe you can say that those screens should have been part of the ans- building answers to whatever play it was. But I think, you know, large reason why, you know, you saw the offense not function as well as it should have had to do with them giving John a little more at the line and him not being as effective doing that as, as they had hoped. I'm glad you said that, Jeff, because that's been a two and I've been playing now for the better part of two months. What changed about the Eagles' offense this year from 2022 to 2023? I think they put too much on Jalen Hurts' plate. And I don't know if it was Nick's decision. I don't know if it was Brian's decision. But they decided because it was very telltale for me. Two weeks in a row on his uh, offensive coordinator press conference when questioned about run-pass ratio, uh, Brian went into defense mode and said, you realize that when we come to the line of scrimmage, there's a built-in run option and a a pass option every single play. And it's yep. decided that he's basically pointing at the QB going, don't look at me. Look at a quarterback. He's deciding how much we run or how much we pass, which certainly grabbed my attention. Is that a fair after season critique? May, they said, well, paying him $250 million. We might as well let him sink or swim here. We'll let him decide what we're going to do on offense. Do you think that's a legit criticism? They gave him too much to do this year. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, and I guess it's understandable. I mean, you just paid this guy this amount of money, amount of money. You believe in him. Jalen likes to call himself a triple threat quarterback. You know, the third element being his mind. And and I think Jalen is 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 the bright guy. And I think that you know there are times when he does check the plays and when he does make reads, um, he's doing he's doing it uh, at a high level. That being said, he's only twenty five years old. Yeah, he's only been, uh, a, you know, everything came to him very quickly in 2022 to the point where he's MVP candidate. And you know, I, I'm I don't want to compare him to Carson Wentz, but I mean, you can see some similarities in you know, Car- Carson got so good in in his second season, 2017, also an MVP candidate, and the Eagles in turn gave him a lot um, because he wanted it, and you know, so there's that delicate balance. Uh, that you, you know, the line you have to walk between uh, entrusting your quarterback after you've given him a lot of money and, but also being like, Hey, you know, you're still young. There's still a lot for you to learn. And, and I don't think the Eagles probably handled that the way they wanted to. And I think, but I also think a lot of it falls on Jalen as well. This was someone that, you know, I had, you know, through various reporting over the course of the, the entire year had learned that um, was, was different a little this year um for whatever reason and i think he allowed it to get to him he got in his head and it kind of filtered down to the rest of the team in terms of how the offense functioned and how and how they behaved and how you know even when they were 10 and 1 um this was a team that just wasn't comfortable with themselves uh you used that phrase delicate balance so uh you know let's be honest in the nfl it's all about the quarterback and the eagles have by their actions to find Jalen Hurts as a franchise quarterback, Jeff. So um, when you look at a decision to remove an offensive coordinator that the quarterback is very close with, is that a calculated gamble saying, all right, maybe this is a wake-up call versus are we going to affect the psyche? And, and I think we all, would, those of us who've been around Jalen, even though he's very guarded, I don't want to compare him to Carson Wentz either because he's very mentally tough. I think he can handle it, but is it a wake-up call or an attempt at a wake-up yeah. call for Jalen Hurts? 
Well, I, I, I don't, I don't know if Jalen's going the bat for, for Brian. Um, maybe this is something he wants, but like, you know, when I, when I was looking, you know, after the season, I'm looking at the, the offense and, you know, Jalen, you know, there was a report from ESPN that Jalen wasn't happy with the direction of the offense. Uh, you know, I'd heard at various points that he was not happy with, with the way he was being utilized, but I, you know, he had a look in the mirror at some point. I mean, you have a scheme that's built around your abilities for the most part. That's, you know, that's what changed everything for him in 2021 when they said, yeah. okay, this is what we're going to do. We're, we're going to, you know, and then they obviously gave play call on the Shane Steichen, but you have basically your preferred offensive coordinator and Brian Johnson. You have one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. You have one of the best wide receiver uh, partnerships in the NFL. You have a, a all pro pro bowl caliber tight end you have Devon. So like, I mean, at some point Jalen, you know, it's not all on just Nick and the scheme and Brian and the play calling. So the Eagles. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I don't know how much Jalen factored into the decision to fire Brian. Uh, I, I just think that they needed to change course and they need to bring in a new mind, someone to look at this offense and either completely change it and come up with a totally different uh, scheme, which, which begs the question, why even keep a Nick for that matter? Or bringing someone just to kind of, you know, give it a, a comb over and say, hey, this is what we need to tinker with and tinker not. But also, and I think this is important, is someone that Jalen isn't comfortable with, right? Um, you know, I think with when you look, if we're going to compare this to Carson Wentz, he was too comfortable with Press Taylor. Uh, a lot of people thought in the building by the end there. And look, in this league, at that position, you need hard coaching. Tom Brady got to hard coaching until in, in New England from Josh McDaniels to the day he, he left there, Tom Brady. And he wanted it. The best quarterbacks in the NFL want the hard coaching. So Jalen is going to have to get used to it because Brian Johnson was not a hard coach, right? I, I think that Brian certainly would point out mistakes in this, that, the other thing, but he wasn't hard. And I think you need that. Um, even in today's NFL, you know, when, when the players have more power and you have a quarterback that's getting paid that much money. And we have heard Sirianni say over the years, last couple of years, several times, Jalen likes hard coaching. Okay. But now I question Sirianni when he speaks, because we know he blatantly lied a couple of times, put the company spin <laughs> out there. So I don't know whether to believe him or not when he said Jalen well, really likes hard coaching. Well, just, just to interject real quick here. I mean, like he, he, his father was on him all the time, hard on him, uh, and built him to to have, take hard coaching. And Nick Saban uh, certainly yeah. wasn't. You know, he benched the, the guy in the national championship game. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, and, and, and Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma is is no uh, you know softy. So it's 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 not like Jalen didn't get hard coaching, but I think it, it all came to him so fast. The success. And look, there's a lot on this kid's shoulder. So I want to look at it from his perspective as well. Um, a lot of pressures that come with that position, and and you know, and and again, he he you know he had success. I mean, he knows you know how maybe he can best be utilized. Um, but I think you always need that bad cop in the building, and I think maybe Nick was the bad cop, the Brian's good cop, but Nick's got Nick's got the whole entire team. He's got to worry about. I don't know how much he was able to kind of play that role. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Jody. I was going to say on the defensive side of the ball, different conversation than offense because we know Nick continued to tell us all year, it's my offense. Yeah, Brian just calling it, but, but it's my offense. So that would be very telltale as to who they hire there. On the defensive side, do you think they just hire a guy rather than hiring a scheme? Now, the guy will come attached to a scheme, will know full well what type of defense he usually tries to run, but do you think the Eagles, after being as dedicated to Fangio as they've been the last several years, can just walk away from that and go, all right, we know we're going to hire a guy and what he brings in is a scheme. That's what's going to become the Philadelphia Eagle defense. Yeah. You know, I, I'm of the opinion that, you know, hire the guy, not the scheme. Um, and, and they became, we've seen when they've hired defensive coaches over the last defensive coordinators over the last how many years it's it's been about the scheme you know nick chip kelly brought in his his scheme uh that he wanted from from college and you know doug peterson well, i don't know if it was much doug as it was how jeffrey yeah. um, brought in the jim schwartz because they wanted they wanted to get back to the type 
of front. And then, you know, it was Nick Sirianni. And, and I think they also wanted, the, you know, the En Vogue Victor scheme when they hired Jonathan Gannon, take away explosive plays, um, let teams run on you. Uh, and then, of course, you know, they wanted Fangio when Gannon left, but Fangio had already committed to the Dolphins. So they basically, they, they had, you know, Greg Schumann was basically the coordinator that they wanted when they went through the rounds of interviews last off season, but he stayed in Georgia at Georgia. So they went to Fangio and he was like, all right, if you don't, if you can't get me, me the next best guy, I think is, is yeah. you know, they hired Sean Desai based not exclusively off that, but certainly that played a role, uh, his endorsement. But now, yeah, I mean, you know, they've, I think the first two names out there are Ron Rivera from the Jim Johnson school. Right. And Mike Caldwell again, played under Jim Johnson plays you know a a little more of that type of scheme i'd be surprised if either of those two guys ends up being the defensive coordinator though really yeah why not schumann jeff i brought that up yesterday i'm I'm like you think about you you have to rebuild this defense and the two pieces here to me the logical foundational pieces are jalen carter and jordan davis up front um and yeah. Schumann knows them, and they liked him before, and that doesn't even add in. You're not going to give up on Nicobe Dean just yet. You're not going to give up on Nolan Smith. I thought Kaylee Ringo showed some nice signs, uh, potential signs for the future. I mean, they're loaded with Georgia guys. Why not try to convince him again? Yeah, he's good. I mean, like he's good clearly, but like I would, I would be wary of of hiring a guy. For- because of players again we're just talking about hiring yeah. brian because yeah. of Jalen and look what happened you know i don't want i don't think you want to make those but they liked him play. though but they liked him so it it, it just happens I, I too poorly need... yeah and, and but jesus i mean that's kind of the the risk of hiring so many guys from one or uh, from one program um i guess maybe i would be careful about doing that um, I, I think these guys all need to be made uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, at, at that defensive coordinator position, scheme, intelligence, that's all very important. But you need someone also as well to have a certain type of mentality at that. And there has to be – you have to be authoritative if you're going to be given complete autonomy over that unit. And the two guys we saw that who do that and did it the best in Philadelphia over the last, you know, several decades were Jim Johnson – and Jim Schwartz, in my opinion. I know there's some people in here didn't like Jim, and there were times where Jim had some bad games. But I think over and all, all in all, Jim Schwartz is, is a very competent, very smart defensive coordinator. So to me, I, I just feel like you need to bring in someone that has that type of command of the room. Um, Sean Desai, smart guy, hard worker. But one of the things I had heard from players was like they just didn't uh, think that he carried himself with a certain type of confidence. Yeah. And yeah. that uh, – yeah. Again, because Jim, Jim, and how the Jim, how the, I always joked about Jim Jeff. He stepped into the building day one like he was a head coach, and that was a problem in 2016. You know, there were some reports of, oh, and he had been a head coach. Um, and he right. had this presence about him, and even Gannon has this presence about him. You, you, you know, former defensive back in college, he had this presence about him. I didn't get that feeling with Sean Desai, but you could tell he's a really bright guy, really smart. He's got educational background. He's a good teacher. But if the players don't buy into it, 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 it's difficult. Uh, Did you get that feel with Sean Desai, at least a little bit? Yeah, I think that was part of it as well. Um, But in his defense, I mean, (laughs) you know, they were 10-3 and when he got demoted. Yeah. Um, They, and they, they were, were thinking they, about it before then, which is the crazy yep. part. Yeah. Yep. He started to take third down away from him at the bye. And, you know, that just uh, kind of reeks of hubris, if you ask me. I just yeah. felt like, you know, and then you had the gauntlet coming up and he won the first two games. Not very – didn't look so great doing so against the Bills. But, you know, they got – you know. I just felt like at that time it, it reeked of panic. Everybody felt it. The players didn't buy in when Patricia jumped in. Patricia was not the answer. Uh, this is this is a guy that just hasn't shown that he's been successful when not under the you know Bill Belichick's defense, right? 
Um, and then they do it, whatever. We, we don't have to relive that. I'm sure the people yeah. who want to listen to this don't want to relive, relive what happened on the defensive side of the ball down the stretch because it was, it was <laughs> among the worst. It was the worst team I've seen it, it, in, in Philadelphia. And we had some bad defenses. I lived through the Juan Castillo, Billy Davis years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had to go there, huh, Jeff? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's not look back. Let's look forward because I'm very intrigued here. You said you'd be surprised with either Rivera and or uh, Caldwell. Schumann maybe too close. Uh, they've already got so many eggs in the Georgia basket. You want to put another one in there? Where do you think they are going to go? If not those three names, and they've all been pretty prominent, who do you think? Who's Jeff McClain's leading candidate? To be the next DC uh, here in Philly. I wish I I'm I'm so wrapped up in in finding out what's going on with the firings and all that stuff that like I you know I I don't spend uh, as much time. You haven't turned about the page yet, huh? I'm, I'm yeah, the it's hard. Well, offensively, I think like an intriguing name to me would be Kellen Moore, but so you know one of the best names out there, still out there. But the question that you know Nick's going to have to answer tomorrow from us, and but also more importantly. Um, when they're asking the question to themselves is, you know, am I going to take my scheme and, and keep it? And then we're just going to bring in someone to play call plays for that. And they're just going to bring some different elements to having kind of look at it with a clear eye, or are we going to bring in someone who's going to bring his scheme, right? And we're going to run his scheme and I'm just going to kind of help in that respect. Um, that's the question. I mean, I, I think if he was Jim Bob Cooter, that would suggest that they're going to stick mostly with Nick's scheme. Yep. Yeah. But my understanding, I don't think Jim Bob Cooper's Cooter's, and I think, and that tells me that Jeffrey wants someone to come in that comes from a different school of thought, and they're going to come up with maybe elements of Nick's scheme and maybe elements of what uh, the scheme that this you know this guy, uh, whatever uh, school of thought he comes from, and on the de uh, defensive side. Um, yeah, and if they want Fangio or they want, you know, like Brandon Staley, is, you know, obviously he oh, failed. Oh, oh, doubt, uh, doubt. But he yeah. has a good. But he, but as a defensive coordinator, he did yeah. a pretty good, pretty damn good job. Um, you know, like I feel like, and, and one of the players said this to to me uh, just recently was like, "We need some war horses." And what he meant by that was, and I, I'm go back again to the Jim Johnson type. Um, that you're probably not going to have to worry about leaving to become a head coach. And someone that ha is authoritative, right, in, in that position. So, like, Kellen Moore, if he has success, he's probably going to leave. You're going to have to – you're right back to square one. You're going to have to work for a head coaching job or go through that again. Why not, you know, find somebody, maybe on both sides, that – you're not worried about having to retain if he has success, right? Someone who, you know, who's been through it and maybe just, you know, so I, you know, I don't know who that is. Um, I, I don't, the problem with that, I think. It's Jim Bob Cooter. Oh, like, no, they can't have him. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's where the well, last I mean, one. Like, Jim, Jim Bob yeah. was just mid. He was mid when he called plays at the Lions. I don't, I don't, I don't understand the fascinating. I think Jim Bob's, from what I understand, a very intelligent guy. But when he yeah. had responsibility for calling plays, he wasn't that successful. Uh, at Jeff underscore McLean, make sure you follow Jeff uh, on X, Twitter, uh, inquire.com. Read him there. One of the best beat writers in the country, never mind Philadelphia, uh, uncovering the birds, the podcast, uh, tremendous as well. You can get that wherever you get your favorite podcast. So you you did some, you, you say you don't think it's going to be Jim Bob. I'm 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 with you there. Tommy Reese got a job in Cleveland. That's a Nick Sirianni uh, guy. Um, Mike McCoy is a Nick Sirianni guy. Frank Reich would be the most notable. I don't know where Frank is in his career. Yeah. If you go a different direction than that and bring in a name like you mentioned, a Kellen Moore, a different idea. At this, at that point, are you just delaying the inevitable with Nick Sirianni? Right. I, right. I, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I was just about to yeah. mention that. Like that will also tell you if they if if like Nick right hires uh Kellen Moore, then 
the questions become, well, if how successful they are offensively or what, you know, is that the guy who's kind of like there in case it doesn't work and they just want to be able to transition him into being the head coach. Now, Cal Moore's never been a head coach before, but, um, and if they're having success, then you, you know, then you keep Nick obviously, but yeah, I mean, you do open that door up, but I think whoever they hire for the most part, that door is going to be open. I mean, we're, you know, look again, new all OC, new DC, from what I understand, we're talking about almost remaking the entire defensive side, uh, staff, coaching staff. I think there could be a few more on the offensive side as well. So you're talking about, you know, six, seven new coaches, eight coaches. I mean, the, you know, obviously the Eagles weren't going to announce that Nick's coming back because they don't want to put, yeah, they don't make his seat any hotter than it needs to be uh, going into the next season. But uh, all the staff changes will say as much that um, his, you know, he's definitely certainly now on the hot seat in terms of what happens in 2024. But yeah, I mean, that's these, these hires are going to say a lot. I think about where Jeffrey and how we stand in terms of Nick's future. All right, Jeff, last one for me, rampant speculation I need out of you. Does Jason Kelsey's fan fanatical moves on weekends when he's not <laughs> playing, a.k.a. this past weekend uh, as uh, why well, he watched his brother play, and I'm sure he's going to be in Baltimore again this week. Do you read positively or negatively into that that he's still considering coming back to the Eagles? Will, will <laughs> having as much fun as he's having – Give him more hope that uh, for the Eagle fans that he's coming back or less. Hey, this is great. I, I have to worry about working out on uh, Monday. I just can continue to get out and have a good time. Yeah. Where do you think Kelsey's at? I think it's Chris Long. Yeah. I think Chris, Chris Long had quote tweeted that and said, oh, you know, everyone thinks this is retiring, Jason Kelsey. This is normal. Jason uh, Kelsey. It's just normal. Uh, yeah. It's, it's more than. Yeah. It's more the younger Kelsey that I knew because I've, trust me, I've seen it off, the, you know. Uh, outside of the Eagles, I've seen, you know, uh, I've seen Jason uh, behave that way. And, and a, I don't say that in a negative way. He's just the life of the party kind of guy. Um, uh, by what I've just, what I've talked to Jason about, you know, um, and what happened in the locker room after the game. Um, he didn't say I'm retiring to the players, but he suggested as much. And, and it was very emotional. It and, um, but he said, Jason's always said that, um, so everyone assumed that, you know, he was telling them that he was going to eventually retire and, and the players were even telling that, telling me that before the final game of the season. Um, and, and, and I wasn't going to report it. I wanted Jason to be the one, uh, to announce it. Uh, I only confirmed what, what had been reported. Um, but he, you know, he, he didn't want to make a decision being that emotional and how he's also felt physically. He never wants to make the decision right away. I think the fact that he went that far and he has always said uh, under the advice of Howard Mudd and other people that you'll know, you'll know. Right. Yeah. So, it, it, I, yeah. It was like when in doubt, don't, but the advice of Jess Dowland was always like, you'll know. And, and I've had a number of indications that he knows um, that being said, the door's open. I mean, you know, he'll sit back. I think he'll watch, you know, he'll follow Travis's run. Uh, I think, if he had planned on making an announcement, uh, he definitely didn't want to do it while Travis was still playing. He didn't want to be a distraction. Uh, but I think he wants to, you know, do it the way that he had envisioned in his mind. And he deserves abs absolutely the, the uh, benefit of doing that himself. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I lied, Jeff. One more, Fletch, because I think retirement is uh, a, a potential bigger yeah. possibility than people realize. Your, your thoughts on, on Fletcher Cox. I, th I think Jordan Davis kind of spilled the beans. And, yeah, and yeah. again, I heard the same thing before the end of the season was like, yeah, I don't think Kelsey and Fletcher are back. Um, and, and that, you know, I thought Fletcher had his best season in, yeah, in tremendous since season. 2018. Yeah. yeah. He had a very good season. Um, and after some subpar seasons for him, you know, it seemed like the, he was just kind of sliding down a slope and just wasn't, performing the way he's capable of still good still good i mean the guy is just as physically gifted as any defensive lineman the eagles have ever had aside from maybe jerome brown um i'm talking modern era um so he could still certainly keep playing if he wants to whether in philadelphia or somewhere else you know but you know he's got interest outside of football 
and uh, loves to fish. I could just see him just going away to his boat and never coming yeah. back and yeah. just spending his entire his life. But, you know, he'll go down, obviously, as one of the greatest Eagles in franchise history. Hall of Famer. Uh, he'll certainly, you know, deserve consideration for the Pro Football Hall of Fame um, when that time comes. But, uh, I, yeah, I agree with you. I think this may be the last we see of Fletcher Cox as well. It was nice, at least for one day, for it to be Mac and Mac and Mac. We like when we get a triple Mac attack going. Jeff McLean, thank you very much for jumping in with us today. We will be asking for your presence again shortly. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. Our Thanks, pleasure. Jeff. Jeff McLean, Inquire here with his son, Birds365. All right, we got to come back. We got to put a bow on the show. But before we do, Birds fans, here's your chance to save up to 40% on your car insurance. You could do so right now with one of Jacob Sports' great partners. Here's what you do. Call managing partner either Jim or Fran and tell them you're a friend of Jacob Sports and Birds 365. Hi, I'm Jim Muehlbronner, Managing Partner at DelVal Insurance Group. Give us a call. We're a local, knowledgeable agency, not an 800 number. Go Birds!